I got you. What's up, Market America? What's going on? How y'all doing today? Today's a little different for me. This ain't about propaganda, standing ovations. This is about belief. This is about your heart. Thank you so much for the love. God bless. Listen, life is ironic. Life has many twists and turns to it. It's so ironic that a little bit over a year ago, I was sitting in the jail cell right across the street from this arena. Could you imagine I was literally living in hell right across the street from here a little bit over a year ago? Jail has a way of discouraging you. Jail has a way of leaving you depressed, leaving you hopeless. It's a very, very, very dark place. And I gotta be honest with you, it's probably the lowest point of my life. One glimmer of hope that I got while I was away was I met a young man, his name is Chef Junior. Now Chef Junior is a real chef. Like his father, his grandparents, they owned restaurants. And when I heard we had an Italian real chef, I, I immediately moved him into my cell. He became my celly, my bunkie, my roommate. And uh, this guy would make mozzarella and cheese, capris, homemade ice cream. The day before I went home, he literally made linguine and clam sauce in jail. <laughs> Don't ask me how he got it. We could probably still go down for that one, right? <laughs> and uh, so Chef Junior's an Italian kid, and every night they would lock us in the cell around 9 o'clock, and, you, and you're forced. That's when everybody starts to read. So Chef Junior would read these books, big books, and every night he would read these books, and these books, I'm not trying to stereotype them, these books was on the Italian mafia. So every night till like three in the morning, it was like we was hanging out. He would tell me stories about hitmans and La Costa Nostra and the five families, and, and, and these, this was like powerful, intriguing stuff, right? And then Chef Junior ain't a nosy guy, but one day he said, yo, Joe, what's all these books? I keep seeing you read the same books over and over and over and over again. And I said, well, Chef Junior, this is my new life. So I got passionate about it and I'm telling him about the business and I'm like, you don't understand, this is, this is an economic movement. We're gonna change the world. And I gotta be prepared because I'm actually talking to Spanish and black people who don't believe nothing, right? So, he was like, but Joe, you're already a rap legend. You're an icon. You do tours, you're a superstar. Why would you do this business? And I said, well, you know, it's my understanding that if you do the same thing over and over again, you can't expect a different outcome. So this is my new endeavor, and I'm passionate about it, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you, there's, I told him, I said, Chef Junior, there's a stadium across the street. I'm going to speak in that stadium to my people. <laughs> Chef Junior, where you at, man? My brother Chef Junior said, stand up, Chef. I don't want to put you on a spot like that. I love you, bro. <laughs> What's crazy is... I told my brother, Chef Junior, I said, yo, Chef Junior, we got five families in Mark in America, too. We actually got a little bit more than that. I said, we got the Ridingers, we got the Weissmans, the Ashleys, we got the Franks, the Buckmans, the Guidos, the Winklers. We even got the Webbers, the Cheese, and the Blascos. <laughs> He's like, damn, Joe, y'all got a big family. <laughs> and I said, you know, these people are people who motivate me and they help others, and I appreciate that. You know, thinking back at that time, there was something that stood out to me very, very, very much. The judge in my case at sentencing, she was a fair lady. I liked the lady. I, I, to be honest with you, I think she was a fair person, a fair judge. And um, so at sentencing, she said a statement to me, 
that was halfway true, but had she said that to me anywhere else, because my life was on her lines, this would be a Fat Joe debate for like 18 hours, right? The first half was right because the courtroom was filled with maybe 250 people, the outside was spilling. I don't think the, court, the courtroom ever seen something like that. My sister Lauren was front and center. I love you, Lauren. And, um, and so she looks at me and she says, she reads these letters of recommendation. And, it, it, and it's from charities like cancer. Fat Joe gave tons of money to the Cancer Society, to AIDS, to kids who go to school and they need computers. There's no computers in the Bronx, giving them furnishing libraries. Bringing Carmelo Anthony to teach these kids how to play ball and stay out of the streets and the life of crime. So it was countless of charities she kept, she kept going through. And she looked at me, she said, you know what, Fat Joe? Joseph Carter, you're pretty remarkable, man. You're actually an incredible guy. But your new wealth is now with your family and friends. Now that statement there was so powerful because it was right. It, it's just no price tag. It was priceless for my friends and my family to support me. But the other half of that statement said, she's looking at it, she said, look, we done already took a million something dollars from them. The accountants must have robbed them for another couple of hundred thousand. The lawyers robbed them for a couple of hundred thousand. This guy's through. His wealth is now with his family and friends. But what she didn't understand, that from a kid from the Bronx, from the projects, to make it to something out of nothing, I got to believe in myself. Nobody believes in me more than me. So I wanted to stand up and say, oh, you wrong. My comeback is going to be mean and vicious. But I calmed down and I said, all right. And you know, you know, I want to talk about addiction. Addictions, obviously my name's Fat Joe, you know what I'm addicted to. <laughs> Be honest. I walk past McDonald's, I feel like the french fries start dancing, talking to me. Joe, come here. Come here. Forget TLS. Come here. I walk past a bakery and the cookies start talking to me. It's almost like the movie Shaka Shopaholic for the ladies. That's what happens to me, right? That's why I moved to chef in myself, right? And, uh, you know, people got addictions. They got the drug addicts. People are addicted to gambling, addicted to sex. Um, one of the most ugliest addictions that I've seen that people have is the addiction of doubt. People tell themselves over and over again, I could never make it. I'll never be a director. I'll never sign people. I'll never even activate. So they doubt themselves. You ever notice a real doubter walks around with an entourage of doubters? And everybody's like, oh, we'll never do that business. It ain't never going to work. You crazy. Them guys are bugging out. They're taking your money. My friends, it's time to believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. And it's time to get rid of the doubters and start hanging out with people that believe. In this business, I met more believers and more optimistic people than I have ever met anywhere in my life. Start hanging out with them. Another, another terrible, 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 terrible addiction is the addiction of pride. Could you believe I meet people that say, oh, I ain't selling no vitamins. I ain't selling no makeup. Picture me going to somebody's house to go present a plan. I'm not trying to be egotistical. I really have done a concert for 40,000 people and walked in somebody's home the next day and showed a plan to two people. Two people. Because I'm dedicated. See, everybody has a destiny. It's time to take control of your destiny. And don't leave your destiny to chance. 
I'm going to tell you, I'm going to keep selling vitamins, web centers, makeup. I don't care. You know, haven't you noticed that everybody can start something, but they never finish? People start something all the time, but they never succeed. Oh, New Year's Eve, I'm getting New Year's resolution, I'm on a diet. January 5th, flatline. <laughs> How many relationships you been in? Oh, I love this guy, I love this girl, you're inseparable. Four months later, flatline. flatline. <laughs> Everybody's willing to start something, but they're not willing to finish it and succeed. But can you finish the job? It's been my experience in life that just about, just about when you're about to succeed, everything turns a little harder. You ever seen that? When you're just about to win, something happens. They kept showing the plan and building the business because they believed in themselves and believed in market America. And now this is where we aspire to be. So I'm telling you, it's pretty capable of doing. You've seen them doing it. You see them doing it. So you have to believe. I am a very, very over-optimistic person. So you ask yourself, you say, man, this guy, he pretty much been through everything. If you Google me, you'll see I've been shot, stabbed, everything you could think of in the universe. <laughs> you be like, how could he still believe? Like, Fat Joe, he's, man, he make me believe. He believes. Well, I'm going to tell you why I believe so much. I was just about 18 years old, and I got my first recording contract, and maybe a week later, we had heard from the doctors that my mother had caught cancer. So the doctor comes and tells my mother, he says, Marie, I have terrible news for you. You have cancer. He said, we got this, back then it was maybe new. He was like, we got this new thing. It's called chemotherapy, and this will probably help you. So we went to the hospital. My mom's did chemotherapy for, for like about four months straight. Her food tasted like metal. She, 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 she had no more energy. You could see the life being sucked right out of my mother, right? One day I went to the hospital and unannounced, and I actually, while my mother was on chemotherapy, I caught my mother smoking a cigarette outside. And I cried so much, I bawled so much. I said, Mommy, please, man, we need you. Mommy, don't do this. I never caught her smoking a cigarette after that, right? But four months later, my mom said, got the results of the chemotherapy, and the doctor came to us and said, listen, it ain't good, Marie. We couldn't get rid of it with the chemo. It's over. Now, you got to understand, I think I'm tough. I think I'm a gangster, but the truth is I'm a mama's boy. So I'm sitting there 18 years old with the most important person to me in my life. And my mother takes it a step worse and looks at me, 18 years old, and says, Joey, I don't want to die. Right? And I was like, it felt like if lightning hit you, like, like breathless, right? And I stepped back, and my mother looks at the doctor. She said, Doc, what would you do to your mother? What would you do for your mother? He said, well, I would just enjoy the last three, four months with my mother. I would just enjoy my time with my mother. And my mother said, but is there any chance, any chance in the world? He said, listen, Marie, you did chemo for four months. You're weak. It's a 99% chance you wouldn't even survive surgery. She said, wait a minute. You said 99. There's 1%. Joey, I believe, I believe I'm the 1%. So I'm looking at my mother, I'm like, mommy, I believe. I believe you're the 1%. So my mother went into surgery and 14 hours later, she came out, they cut her from here to here. 
Her head was this big. Her tongue was this big. And we had to coach everybody before you walked in the room, like, yo, don't cry in front of her. Don't make her feel like that. Just hold it up. Hold it up. And uh, 23 years later, my mother's still with us today because she believed. Right? So you ask me, how come I believe? I've been through the worst. I've seen it all, and I believe, and I want to thank God for that, because without God, there's nothing. Believe that. Without God, there's nothing. I ain't come out here today for all that. I came to tell you something, man. I sat down, I said, man, I drive these people crazy. I make them scream. They jump out their socks. Their hair look crazy. I said, no, we ain't doing that today. We speaking from the heart. We gonna make you believe if you don't believe yet. But you know who doesn't need a speech? Who doesn't need no hyping up? Who doesn't need anybody to get them going? J.R. Reidinger started this company 23 years ago because he believed in you. He believed that you were being treated unfairly, that you wasn't, wasn't getting paid correctly for your work efforts. He believed that people shouldn't be in competition with each other, that people should help each other. And through everybody's efforts, everybody would get paid together. So he started this with no interview, no internet, no social media, no nothing, just a dream. And he kept believing. And he knocked door to door. And we see my sister's always beautiful, $10,000 dresses and all that. But I know she was banging on doors, trying to sell some thermochrome, trying to sell a gold pencil, whatever it was, to get that money. We always see the finished product, Big Al. Big Al, I salute you because you've been in the business 19 years and you won the President's Challenge last day, two days ago. You're still in the street showing the plan. 19 years, he's still showing the plan. Big Al. So now, 23 years later, Fat Joe joins the business, and JR pulls out a bullhorn, and when he pulls out a bullhorn, the joint just keep growing. <laughs> it's damn near a satellite. <laughs> shot bing a no way, shot bing a no, shot bing a no way, shot bing. That's a bad mother, <laughs> you know? That's a bad boy, right? The other day, me and Mark Ashley was hanging out, my brother Mark, I love you. We was hanging out watching the Super Bowl. And the guy threw the pass at the one yard line. And everybody's looking like, what just happened? Well, if he had the shop in the Nordy, he would have caught the pass. <laughs> I want to tell you what we did behind your back. Me and Mark looked at each other like, yo, this dude is crazy. <laughs> By the way, keeping it real 100. <laughs> but the shop in the Nordy is nothing different than day one. It's all about converting your spending into earning, right? So now it's my understanding that everybody who made it successfully was stacking people up and people, you know, they, you know there's people who hang out, there's almost like a social movement, they meet their minimum requirements, there's so many of them that you start flushing. But they messed the point. The point is, if those people who are doing the minimum requirements start actually buying from themselves, no one's telling you to buy a pink elephant. No one's telling you to buy a rainbow unicorn. <laughs> buy what you buy. Now, they might sugarcoat it to you. I know it takes a little time. I've been doing the shopping annuity myself. 
But once you start looking and you find great deals, Match.com give you 50% back IBV, but hold up, right? <laughs> so the point is, I threw a barbecue for my, for, for, for my team the other day in my house, and I bought it all with IBV. I bought steaks, chickens, fish, lobster. I went to Raise.com, my partner store, bought the gift certificates, went and bought the steaks, got cash back, and IBV. And Bishop, you was in my house at 3 in the morning. I ain't going to tell him about that apple cobbler, Bishop. Nah. The point is, love you, Bishop. The point is, I'm pretty sure we could just about get 80 to 90 percent of the stuff that we buy, and it's going to get bigger and better and better and better and better. Thank you so much, Mark in America. I love you. Shout out my brothers, the Tats crew. Hey, yo. Hey, yo, Bio. Come out. Shout out my brother, Nysa. My brother, Bio. Shame, 125th. BG. Come here, man. Stop being scared, bro. Here we are. Boy, that's beautiful, man. God bless. Take a picture of my crew. Thank you very much, Lorena, I love you. Azzy, I love you. Everybody, I love y'all. Be good, baby.